The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hello and welcome to the very first set of website evaluations for the 2020 Orchestration Challenge. This is just really, really exciting. I put out the word exactly a month ago, or I guess at this point about five and a half, six weeks, and everybody delivered. <clears throat> People came through with 146 scores and I think last time it took me about three weeks to get through 75 scores, so we'll just see how much time this takes me. I've budgeted time, and I actually don't have any big projects immediately happening, and I've got a few things coming up maybe in June or July, so I'm, I have a lot of time right now, so this is going to be fun. So let's just jump right into it with this first entry by Lazi, and <clears throat> it has a really nice sound to it, doesn't it? Um, have, after having listened to that playback, there's a nice tranquil feeling to it. Okay, however, <laughs> I'm not here to praise every score. I am here to give you feedback on problems or realities that you are going to run into. Now, the feeling that I get here sort of harmonically is that it really is weighed down by these low Fs. That just really is, there's a lot of emphasis and it really kind of tends to sort of stick there. Now, it's not to say that this note F is not part of the harmony, but there really is a lot of emphasis and it seems to be kind of maybe holding the music back just a teeny little bit. Not so much in the fact that it exists, but just perhaps in the way that it is really rooting things down. Um, and it's it's more, it's happening more in the harp, right? I feel like right here, there's all this momentum going upwards and you just have a couple of notes here on the harp instead of more arpeggiation. In terms of balance here, there really isn't anything that is all that uh, inappropriate. Here you're saying divisi ad due. Well, you know, like it, everybody knows that it is going to be divisi into those two notes. You don't have to say that. All you have to do is just say D I V period. All right. We know how many you are going to divide into because we can just see it, right? The player can just see it. So just all you have to do is just say div for divisi. And then U N I S period, unis. For unisony, right? So just you don't have to write out the entire word. And here you can just say, you know, div e pits, right? You don't have to say divisi, ah uh, due. You don't have to do the whole thing, right? Okay. Um, and there's a couple of strange notational things here. You've got this kind of pause with the fermata mark over it, and then here you've got another pausa, and I, they don't. I don't think that they're in the right places. Maybe they jumped across. Like maybe perhaps the place for a pause would be right here after the phrase, then ra rather than right in the middle of the big crescendo. Right? It just seems like it is in the wrong place. 
Okay, all right, so I just got sidetracked by those little notational things, but they did sort of seem a little strange. Here's another notational thing. Yeah, so I, I think you mean that this is supposed to be like um, a held triangle, like a muted triangle, just a, you know, holding it with the hand so that it has kind of a tink sound instead of a ting. Um, so it might be good to point that out, just say damp over the first one or, um, you, you know, what whatever term that might be in the region that you use or the for the players that you score for. Okay, uh, all right, otherwise, um, notationally, it's okay. Um, and it's all in C, as we can see, with the bass clarinet sounding an octave lower than written. Okay, that's all good. Now here you've got this uh, triple octave in the melody with the bass clarinet and bassoon doubling and then you've got the horn in the middle and the flute on top. Now here, if you really are going to do this mezzo forte, crescendo to forte, nobody's going to hear anything else there. right? That This is, I think, something that we've talked about before. And, you know, and the same thing here, you've got pianissimo to mezzo piano and back. And here you have this huge uh, horn solo here in the middle. Now you can just write the horn at the same exact dynamic as everybody else and it will shine through fine. It'll it'll sound perfect. And this is kind of strange. You start at mezzo forte to forte and here you're mezzo piano to forte. And that's kind of strange. I'm wondering if there were some notational errors here, like maybe you did not work it out totally. You maybe you intended this to be piano to mezzo piano at first and then then building. But yes, uh this note here, this uh, high written C sharp, or excuse me, this high sounding C sharp, because we are in the key of C in terms of our, uh, we're in concert C as we're reading. This is going to be written G sharp. Okay, so that on a forte is all fine, but it is extremely penetrating. Anything above written F is really has a that has some force to it. So here you're starting off delicately, right? You say lightly, but this isn't a light note. This C sharp right in here, uh, that is you know sounding G sharp. Now down here you've got these low F sharps in the fourth horn, and <clears throat> those are going to be kind of unstable, right? Because that is such a low note. It would be better if you really wanted that for horn for that to be doubled. So the second and fourth could be doubling on that and then you could have a different strategy for the um, for the harmony in here. Actually, this really is a trombone part. If you were to ask me, I would say that's bass trombone on the bottom and then the, uh, the two tenors above. So that's really what it feels like to me. Now this is this is horn writing in here, okay? But this is really like a trombone part. So, you know, if that were maybe a tuba at the bottom with a couple of horns, that would that would also be a beautiful blend and it would free up your fourth horn for more harmonic duties. Now here, it's like you've got um, the antique cymbals right in here and celesta, and that just does not go together. That doesn't make sense with the strength of the horn right in here, right? And, and this beautiful, delicate scoring here for the flute that doesn't make sense either with this the power of the horn that you've got right in here with the melody. Okay, not to get off on that too much, but <clears throat> yeah, so here we've got the Divisi strings building in power, but then you sort of take away the crescendo. You've got these this big push here, mezzo piano to forte, mezzo forte to forte, forte crescendo. By the time you get to hear that is going to be fortissimo, right? So here you have to mark piano subito, or P-S-U-B period, right? Piano subito, so that, so that the... Um, so I, I can see this the sense in having a slight pausa here, but it's still... you know, it still is out of balance. The strings are way out of balance with what's going on in the timpani and the horn and and winds. It, it, it is just really going to have this big glaring sound. And then suddenly 
dropping out in the middle of this, I think is a little showy. It's a little, it's a, sort of like saying, hey, see what I can do? Ha ha, right? Okay, all right, continuing on, we get up to this big apex and you are asking for a pianiss pianissimo note <clears throat> up here on a high F sharp with your adue oboes, right? Your, your two oboes. This right here is a flute part. And this is more of an oboe part, except once again, high F sharp, it's really hard to control. I mean, it is, it's playable, don't get me wrong, but it, it is not a pretty note, okay? This is more of a clarinet thing, I would say. Like if you want much a much more controlled high F sharp, um, it's better on clarinet if you have to do that at all, right? I mean, the overtones, you could do this an octave lower in oboes, and this an octave lower in English horn, and then you could get just the overtones doing the work of what you want to do here, right? Rather than actually sending those two oboes way up there to F sharp and then asking them to play this huge fine pianissimo right in here. They're just, they're just easier ways to do what you need to do here. All right, and then <clears throat> we have flutes and and uh, sorry, I'm pointing at the wrong thing. Flutes and violins playing in octaves together. Here, it's it really would be better to have clarinet on the bottom or or oboe on the bottom because these notes right in here. I'm not going to say they're not. I'm not going to say that they're out of range, but they really do not have a whole lot of carrying power for the second flute, and they don't really they're not really going to contribute much to the blend right in here of these divisi strings all right and then this is all fine now here you've got um <clears throat> you've got these tenuto articulation notes and it really means two completely different things the way that you've got this scored see you shouldn't do this you shouldn't have portato notes and then have the slur continue on. You should stop here with your slur, right? Like this is great. The second voice in this staff is perfect, right? Because that is a nice portato, dun, 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 right? Um, there's a sense of separation between the two or, or, or sort of push, right? There's a kind of a extra push with the, with the uh, diaphragm of the wind player or brass player. But here, like, this is a completely different thing to leave the the slur off right that so what do you mean right that that the the conductor would be probably just saying hey look can you do um slurs across the flute and bassoon parts right to make them more portato now here the an, we have a balance problem right you are asking the horns and the flutes to play in unison and the flutes are just gone they don't exist right the horns are so pungent even at piano they will push this off so if the flutes were marked mezzo forte and the and the horns were marked pianissimo then you would have a blend right but here it is just all horns with just barely any you know barely anything contributing here i mean you would be you would be better off marking this as mezzo forte staccato to to match with the pizzicato in the second violins okay and then here see this is more workable right but this yeah just you really have to know what you're doing when you do a when you have a um slur mark across tenuto articulation marks so that is that is a specific kind of playing okay so it, it you can't just continue this on as if it were one nice big slur because that doesn't mean anything right so just just do it like this all right don't make your slur keep going as if this were some nicely slurred thing the same thing here for and you know have the same approach for wind and brass instruments in terms of tonguing if you want things to be unified right and it you know slurring and tonguing all right <clears throat> so moving on to this last little bit of screen Okay, so, so this is kind of problematic too. You have a single wind voice going all the way through, okay? And then you've got solo violin playing octaves, solo viola playing 
intervals and solo cello and so on two two solo double basses okay so and you've got the mezzo forte as composed to as excuse me as compared to piano in the winds and I, I mean I see what you're trying to do here I mean that is a nice delicate kind of thing but once again we've got that really beautiful radiant tone of the horn right in the middle and that is going to tend to glare all right and yes yeah, so, and this chord at the end is is okay that's all right yeah so no big no big complaints or anything or 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 too much feedback about that that's okay all right but I'm more worried that this you know there really is no need for the strings to go down to such small numbers you know to i, I mean it, they're really despite them playing mezzo forte and the winds and horns playing piano they're, they're still not going to be balanced in terms of the weight of the timbre okay it would be better for you just to have um, just to have all the strings playing in each of these sections, you know, just have divisi cellos, divisi uh, violins, and then uh, first violins on top, second violins on the bottom, you know, th that way you'll get a balanced sound, okay? So balance isn't always just about dynamics, dynamic strength, it's also about the tone weight, okay? So that's all I've got to say for this score, really, really great score to start with. Now let's get on to the next one. Now we have the mysteriously named Luke's score. And Luke has contributed, I think, two or three scores already to these annual challenges. At least I'm, I know that he did last year. So Luke, it's great to have a score from you once again. And it, this is just a really nice score. I really like the restraint here. Like, you're, you know, you're not throwing everything at it. You're just doing as much as you feel that you need okay so <clears throat> let's talk about a few things here a, a few fundamental things um, one is slurring across the downbeat okay so this piece has a lot of slurring across the downbeat now slurring across the downbeat is a great way to sort of seal together phrases uh, almost like overlapping like you do right here right you've got this phrase continuing on and then this one right here of course this is kind of meaningless isn't it because you are already giving the second players here the slur that continues on right so the proper thing to do here would be to have a slur for either group right just to be clearer in terms of notation you would actually split these into two separate voices even in this bar right here so you'd have the first voice slurring to there and then the second voice slurring all the way across to there in, in one big slur because the way that this is written right here just doesn't make any sense um you know in in a in a pure way the same thing here you've got this big slur right over here and then this continues on well what is that supposed to be right so just you know try to be more clear about that but the main thing slurring across the downbeat is i mean if you actually have a place where the music comes to a point where it is actually saying something da 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 you really rob that note that destination note of its emphasis when you slur across it da da, da right as opposed to da 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 da, da. so i mean i can i can see the sort of phrasing logic and that's fine but and this is really nice too the way that the flutes sort of creep up on the melody helping out 
and you are kind of getting around certain certain possible problems of notes interfering with each other, uh, which I just ignored in my own uh, arrangement because I don't think it's really all that important. Okay, and then like this is kind of strange. You have a tie below, but like nothing above, like a slur above on the higher voice. Like, so it's it's a little strange the way that that you did this, right? So this this I would also if you really want this upper voice to be enunciated on each note and the lower one to be tied, then it really should be two separate voices. And then that's much easier to understand for the copyist and the score reader. Okay. All right. So you're starting off here solo what? Solo first oboe, right? Is that the first oboe? Who is it, right? Solo, because it could be soli, um, two oboes. So just really always mark how many people are playing, you know, one period solo. Okay. And then here you've got this interesting idea here of the bassoon playing E, and then you've got your clarinets in A, um, and yeah, they are um, playing right alongside the bassoons there. And this is a really nice sound, the using the lower winds in this way. It, that's, that's nicely done, no problems there. And then a little touch of horn coming in there as the strings start to get bigger. Okay, so, but there's really no indication. Um, you can't just go piano, crescendo, and then another crescendo. You have to let us know where we are when we get to right here, right? Because this could be interpreted as, oh, well, this bar, you know, starts soft and then does a crescendo. And then this one starts soft and does a crescendo, right? If you really just mean for this to crescendo onwards across two bars, then it should be one hairpin, all right? Not two in a row. Because this really kind of suggests something different. I, I, I mean, it, it sounds uh, it sounds like a continuous crescendo in Sibelius, but Sibelius doesn't know what it's doing, all right? You know, it, it only knows what you tell it to do, and that is not necessarily the way that... Um, that scoring practice works in in the real world, okay? So, um, yeah, and right in, right in here, see this is unclear. Is this supposed to be slurred in the second voice or, you know, or what's going on? See here you have a second, uh, first voice and second voice slur across the same beats, and here you don't, right? So maybe a little bit more proofreading there. But yeah, but, yeah, but here is the biggest a fatal error that would, you know, this would get the score sent back to the composer. Uh, there is really no way to bow this, right? This is, I mean, yeah, you could, but you just would end up with a very, very weak phrasing, all right? Like the, the bow is much, much shorter um, than, than the breath, right? In terms of how long it can play with before it has to change direction. So really, you have to think about you know, think of Lili's phrasing, right? Or think of um, think of phrasing in, in groups of bars, right? Each bar, right? You could you could slur across the bar, like from here to there, right? Have little slurs like this, or you could have slurs that cover each bar, or you could have a slur that goes down up, right? So. Um, just, just you know, try not to have big phrase marks over things that the string players have to play. Work out what the phrasing would be, but don't add bowing marks, right? This doesn't really mean anything. I mean, a bow and then pizzicato at the end, right? I mean, I, I see what you're doing. You're trying to set up this stroke so that the frog of the bow will be right there ready for the pizzicato at the end. So, I mean, just leave that up to the players. You don't really need to mark that, okay? It'll, it'll be obvious if it's a concern, okay? All right. So, yeah, so here's another example of slurring across the downbeat, weakening things, right? So this slur kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's robbing this downbeat of its punch, right? Okay, and this is all fun. This is this is nicely done, and yeah, and you know, I, I think that these could be 
these slurs could be broken down into shorter groups, you know. So, da, 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 right? That's, it's rather than, or even could be da, 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 or da, 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 da. I just, there just doesn't seem to be enough meaning in this, the way that it just has a nice long slur over it, okay? <clears throat> and this is all done in a very smooth legato style. And it's pretty good. I, I like the horns uh, doubled with the trombones. That's a really nice balance, okay? And if they're playing softly, then they can get away with this, uh, this doubling right in here. And good balance, all right? Then here, that is a really beautiful... Um, you know, nice, clear Russian sound right in here. So it's got just a little bit of support from the strings, but it's really, it really is radiant. It's Russian in like a Tchaikovsky way, right? Rather than like in a Borodin or, or Rimsky-Korsakov way, all right? And then this is really, really nice. Okay, so what's cool about this right in here is the way that you've worked out the harmony right in here. So you've got your descending trombones and trumpets and the horns in the middle. Okay, well and good. And then right at the end, the horns come in and take over on the, um, on the harmony above, right? And there's just a little bit of lower heavy brass and timpani at the end. And that's really, really cool because you know, that upper voice before was in the trumpets, which have a different sound, and then it ends with that really lovely sound right in here of the, uh, of the horns with that, with that less crisp, more embracing sound. So really, really great score, Luke. I, you know, I, I am critiquing you a lot on your slurring and on some other minor points, but, you know, generally speaking, it was... You know, it was it was really nice. You're thinking more about balance, and you're thinking more about uh, about delicate textures. And for the most part, you are achieving that. Okay, so really nice work. Uh, I, I really like the way that your um, like doubling of certain elements is not necessarily identical. There is motion in your parts, and and individuality in certain lines, and that's all really, really nice, okay? So really great work. I'm so glad you're able to contribute again this year, and I hope to see you next year because I intend to continue doing these challenges. All right, so thank you very much. Now on to the next score. And now for this score by Finley. Okay, so really, really nice scoring. Apologies for the way that certain bars don't work across this break where you had vertical pages, right? First you had three bassoons all together and then you had the separate bassoons set up um, so that they could be divided into uh, two different staves. So yeah, apologies about that, but I just wanted to have these pages laid out uh, in this horizontal format so it's easier to evaluate on screen. Okay, so all that aside, a really, really nice orchestration. So there are a few things in here that are going to be a little out of range or are going to balance a little strangely if they balance at all. So right here you've got you've got these uh, mezzo forte brass and you've got this low range harp so that is just you know this is not going to come through at all it's just not going to be audible against this slight cushion here of 
uh, you know, you've got your clarinet and you've got some strings in here. See, harp would, you could, you could get away with harp sounding like something above the clarinets here or along with the clarinet. Okay, but pizzicato, right? Mezzo forte pizzicato against harp. The harp is just going to be buried. Okay, and you can even hear that in the mock-up. Um, it just doesn't have you know it's just 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 not big of a it's not as big of a of an instrument or a sound as you as you may think right sorry i was pointing to celesta there just a second ago okay and then celesta coming in here this is also going to get swamped by the um by the winds and brass mezzo forte brass in here and then you know this is going to come through a little bit but I would say even just taking everything up a couple octaves or you know or or another octave for the harp is would really or even just focusing on the that upper range would be uh easier right in here this will come through fine but yeah but here like right at the end this will work but like right in here this is not going to really contribute very much to the sound picture okay so yeah so maybe an octave higher it would all right, but it, it will easily get buried by the clarinets and flute uh, unison right in here. Okay, so solo, like I just mentioned for Luke, uh, one period solo, right? We have to know which instrument is playing the solo. We can't just say solo and then assume that that means the first player because who knows what's going on in the rest of the score, right? Okay, we got this whoppingly high written A here for the first player on a piano. And, you know, if you are a specialist clarinetist, you can actually get that note. But it's just really, really hard. There are so many other instruments that can play it well. And, and you know, here we got this F sharp, right? Um, it's the same note in concert pitch, and it's already being covered by the flute. So you do not need the flute to be doubled with anybody. You've already got, um, you know, the ability, like this note could be given to the um the first clarinet so they could just be doubling there and then this could be doubling with the first flute all right so it's just it's just really a big ask to you know have the player get that really high note and really really soft all right you, they, they just will lack the control right um and you know what are the strings doing to contribute to that high texture they're not doing anything right so there there are some decisions that you could make here that would work better okay especially with a reading kind of situation you know when when <clears throat> we just don't have the same um, time for everybody to put into a score here we've got the, you know this right here you've got these bees in the first uh, bassoon and your oboe player would play those much much better um, with hardly any effort and sound pretty much the same as as what you want right because right all you're doing really is just doubling the top line of the uh, you know the the first clarinet right with that with that first bassoon and it just is you know it's it's going to be a kind of slightly squeaky breathless note uh, doubling a very confident precise note right so that it really would be better to double that with oboe and not with bassoon all right just my opinion there okay and there was this one other thing um which i guess i guess i will come to when i get there okay so right in here i think the timpani is really really fun but i think that it starts to wear out its welcome by around right here right because one of the things is just dynamically right i mean here you've got um, you know, you got mezzo forte in your harp and pizzicato right in here, and bassoon and bass clarinet. Okay, that's that's great, but the sound picture above starts to soften, and then right in here, you know, you're still playing mezzo forte. It just really just seems kind of I don't know, chilling is the wrong word, but it just really seems just like it's starting to get you know like too much it's um, almost like you know here it's good here i can go with you it's, you know continuing on but here it's just like well you know i mean we all right we know 
You know what I mean? Maybe you could cut out the timpani right in here and just leave harp and bass clarinet and a little bit of pizzicato down there, right? And, you know, make it softer. But this is really nice at the end, okay? So maybe this could have been cut down to piano here and then, then this would just be piano there, right? Okay, <clears throat> all right, so those are just some thoughts about that. Um, all right, so let's talk about texture overall. Um, this is going to be really pretty thick, um, the way that this is all doubled. And you know, like when you see that, how this is like first flute and um, Atu clarinets and so on, I mean, that makes more sense for that. You, you know, I can see why you would want to put that up there, but it's still not a great idea. <coughs> you have to think about overtones doing the work, right? So the overtone of the first flute and first oboe right and and you know second uh, sorry second clarinet to a degree although they have a different kind of overtone english horn would be more what i would think so just forget about the the second clarinet so english horn first oboe second flute that will also <clears throat> provide enough resonance to this first flute to where it doesn't need to be doubled by the clarinet okay so um and it's it's nice that we've got this motion in here, <clears throat> uh, double bass, right? You might want to say DB rather than just bass, you know, or 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 CB for contrabass. I prefer double bass, but it's just you know, <clears throat> it's just whatever works for you. Um, but yeah, but just bass, it's it's you know, it's it's a little, um, you know, a little uninformative. Okay, so you've got bass clarinet, you've got descending tuba and bass kind of like along the same pitches, and then you've got this kind of rooting F sharp going on. Um, and, I, and I feel that this starts to kind of interfere with the music. Like it, it, we, it takes away from our sense of motion, right? So maybe if the F sharp were, you know, if we were just leaving the F sharp to be continuing on in that octave. It would just it would be a little less confused down there. This is really nice. The the brass scoring in there. Um, that's that's all good uh, for the most part. <clears throat> you have to excuse you, you'll have to excuse me clearing my throat a lot. It's um, <laughs> it's four in the morning. So yeah, um, I just I don't know. I just I set this day aside to start doing the evaluations, and it's just real exciting. So. I woke up at around 2.30 and I just couldn't get back to sleep, so I came down here and started working. <clears throat> this is mainly cool, though. I mean, aside from the the um, high bassoon, and this is nicely worked out. You know, I like those little touches of bassoon and clarinet. <clears throat> I like um, the way that the strings staccato and then... Um, and then winds um, sort of call and response. Right here, you really want to give the cellos a, um, a tenor clef, just just easier on their reading in terms of where they need to figure out their finger positions. I mean, you're asking the cellos to go really high there, you know, it, and you you're doubling this um, this high B so much. You know, you've got it in firsts and seconds and cellos, right? It's you know maybe you don't need that top note there in the cellos. And then same thing here. I mean that you know even even if it weren't questionable that that high B um, would be this delicate little note that could just be popped out you know with no problem at all, um, which some players can, but some players it's just not the greatest results. Um, I would still want a tenor clef right in here. All right, so all right then this is really really cool in here. Da 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 da. Yeah, I mean, you know, English horn and so we basically have the oboe family plus the winds and celesta. So, I mean, the celesta will sort of work here, but yeah, I mean, it should be okay. But yeah, just right in here, this is going to get buried a bit. Um, and this is, yeah, all pretty, pretty nice standard string scoring. <clears throat> and then here you kind of stretch out that resolution. So yeah, 
a really, really fun score, Finley. I, I, I thought this was a, a nice, strong entry to our challenge. Of course, there's no prizes here. Nobody is bigger than anybody else. And in fact, these scores are being eva evaluated not in terms of like quality or, or you know, experience or anything. It's just purely in terms of um, who's, you know, who, who submitted their score first, right? So, um, you know, so uh, this group of scores is the first uh, six scores that were submitted and I am evaluating them in the order they were submitted. So I think that just it it mixes things up and it makes things fun and you hear a, a big difference in terms of approach and and outlook and so on. So yeah, really, really cool score. All right, on to the next one. Here's an intriguing contribution from Elliot, and there's, there's just so many fun things in here. Wine glasses. Now, I, I'm not sure that that um, this is going to work. So you've got like accents over the tide, the tide notes. So maybe you know, maybe you know more about wine glass playing than I do. But I guess. You know that you were you kind of wanted some kind of um, push there, or maybe the accents were intended for the the different notes, or maybe that's some kind of you know wine glass notation. Um, <clears throat> the only thing I'm not sure about here is how well this will work. Really, I mean English horn playing against wine glasses. Wine glasses are really soft; they really don't project. Do you know what I mean? They don't. Um, they don't really have a lot of power to them. It's kind of like a uh, bowed cymbal, but even more delicate. So it doesn't, it isn't really a sound that pushes outwards. And English horn is, right? It, it has a very penetrating sound. So, I mean, I, I feel like maybe flute or <clears throat> maybe like oboe played in its lowest reg, sorry, sorry, not oboe. Uh, piccolo played in its lowest register would be like uh, maybe a better match for what's going on with the wine glasses. But like the the thing about the wine glass sound is that it has a kind of a um, there's a little bit of a um, kind of this hanging resonance, right? And I can just see it being swallowed by English horn. Now maybe you've scored for English horn and wine glasses before, so. You know, if so, that you know the combination worked for you, then great. But <laughs> I feel that there would have to be a lot of balancing going on here, and it would just be very difficult. So maybe there's a different group of instruments that could play this. Like maybe um, uh, I would think um, like harm harmonics in the strings, right? Would so it would probably be better to add that as an osia, right? So just like have some harmonies in like the say cellos and violas some harmonics covering those same pitches <clears throat> uh, that could be thrown in there. Okay, and then you have vibraphone coming in and celesta. Now in this case it will work because there isn't a lot of brass going on and you know what what winds and strings are accompanying here are very delicate but it's still like okay the, I'm seeing a lot of celesta scored in its you know, in its middle range and some lower range stuff, and and that has this kind of funky sound. Okay, so I mean, not so bad, but like the beginning here and these kind of middle pitches right in here, right? But like you really are going to start to hear better qualities as the notes rise. Okay, um, <clears throat> I mean, I I have one or two lower celesta notes in my score as well, but I did comment on the reason why I was using them. Now vibraphone, of course, is 
so much stronger of an instrument to use there and you know kind of taking over and helping out the progression of the melody makes a lot of sense and in fact i think the vibraphone could possibly overwhelm the celesta so there's there's that slight danger there anyway <clears throat> still pretty cool um yeah i mean it's 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 well organized but um, there are some things about this that um you know I'm, I'm still not completely comfortable about and you know one of these is like slurring across the beat like slurring over a tenuto mark right so tenuto means to play with a full bow right <clears throat> so uh but when you have a slur over a tenuto it could mean portato like i mentioned before or it could mean a, you know a one or two other things so it's really better not to not to have a slur covering a single tenuto mark in the middle of a phrase like this it would be better to have something like this um like this right so it's it's better that way like the player can get the long bow on this particular note and then just make it match below right is that do they have a tenuto on it i thought that the slur might be covering it all right so <clears throat> yeah just you know, try to be simpler in your bowing see this is great like you've got a group of two beats covered by one bow in these two instruments right and then the violins are slurring across the downbeat right so you don't really get that sense of of a hit right in here you know like you don't get the power of that of that you know of that that unified downbeat you don't want to get into a situation where there are so many slurs across downbeats that the players are asking each other hey who's got the downbeat at bar six you know they you don't want that kind of thing now here it's not a big <clears throat> this is really no big deal but just you know with music that really has like a push to it right you know like there you you're you're headed somewhere with your dynamics and you're landing there right just you know try to avoid that now apologies for <clears throat> the note performer cymbal sounds they're just you know they're just not very good but we're, while we are on this topic of that <clears throat> a piano dynamic with a triangle beater is one thing a mezzo forte dynamic is completely another all right so the the players are probably not going to want to do either I think it is probably enough for you to have this stroke played just by a simple uh, a simple snare stick okay and then <clears throat> here mallets what does mallets mean soft mallets hard mallets what mallets right so you just have to say what kind of mallet you want there right so I would just say stick and then um, soft beaters or soft mallets stick soft mallets and you get the you get the sound that you want you want a tish right that's that's really what you want that like really crisp kind of a tish sound right uh, and and you will largely get that with a snare stick okay you don't have to do metal on metal which is really something that percussionists don't like to um, to do especially to cymbals which cost like you know sometimes thousands of dollars and are very delicate things uh, so you know despite the fact that they're smashed so hard in rock and roll music it's still you know <clears throat> still as long as they're being hit in the right way they'll still last a long long time okay now here um i like all of this in here this is fine okay it's like the the placement is good the mixture with the celesta is fun and the support from the strings is nice okay and then this little harp in here you know whatever like you know it's, it's fine it'll work okay now here this is good this little celesta thing that's great and this harp right in here very very refreshing okay so i think you know the main the main problem here is is more like like how how big do you want the dynamics to go and do you really want the the sound of the closed horns right the like the like the kind of that kind of raspy 
sound, right? Because it's it's fine to just send the the horns down to like like pianissimo or even triple P there, right? And just have them playing really softly in the background without having to stop them or mute them at all. Okay, so like you know, right here, you're just going to get a very crisp, snarly sound in the back of this beautiful lush screen, string scoring. Okay, so. It is not a dist. I mean, it's a distant sound, but it's not a, you know, it's not a a, a sweet um, lyrical sound. All right, and then you know, right in here we've got this sort of call and response thing here. I like this. You know, between the um, between the percussion and upper winds, and then the middle winds right in here. That's that's a really lovely thing. The middle winds and horns, and <clears throat> that's all good. I, I like the fact that you were using similar, you know, uh, similar timbres but differentiated enough with the right kind of uh, doubling with other instruments, and then, you know, this the the um, the sense of strings, um, kind of punctuating. Okay, that's all really really cool. And then once again, we've got um, brass coming in and playing this really you know really kind of soft and and you know I like the different um, the different symbols idea <clears throat> and yeah it's, this is all going to work pretty well okay you know so like buzz like you know with okay so so a buzz roll is a really specific thing where the um, the the stick kind of drops onto the membrane of the drum and it bounces, you know, da 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 da, da you know, um, and then then you can do a buzz roll with like the sticks just kind of flopping back and forth, and that's a specific effect. But I, I mean, I'm not so sure how that you know necessarily is going to be a whole lot different from just the regular kind of stick technique, you know, like a. I mean, I, I've what I've heard with buzz roll is kind of more of a, you know, it's it's a more kind of prominent effect than a subtle one. Do you know what I mean? Like right here, you're really going for subtlety, and you're bringing this out, you know, that kind of sound. I mean, I like the brushes, the idea of using brushes here, and um, I think it would have been perfectly fine just to continue using brushes. You know, it, it doesn't have to be innovation in every bar, right? Okay, and you know this is all good. I like the little, um, the little harmonics in here. That's all fun. Not so sure how much it is going to come out against the, against the horns, but I mean it's 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 something fun to play with. Maybe like this could be balanced in, um, in rehearsal. Okay, so, anyways, really really cool score. Um, I could pick this apart. Um, endlessly just pointing out different little things but yeah I would just say watch out for stopped horn it's it has a very snarly sound as opposed to I mean I like the mixture of stopped and and open horn but it's still will you know they still have that kind of distant kind of crisp eh, kind of sound in the back where you have this beautiful kind of lush playing happening with everybody else right so watch out for things like that okay um, really really great thanks so much for contributing this, Elliot. Now on to the next entry. Well, 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 Samuel. <laughs> that is a very cinematic approach. Now, I will give you a pass on reharmonizing a lot of bars in here. I, I, I mean, when you do that, you sort of take away the period, um, the, the kind of period feel, don't you? Right? Like when you, like the, the way that you approached the end of this phrase here, and then. You know some of these other phrases, sort of more being boldly cinematic in a in a kind of more mainstream way. Um, 
that's all cool. Um, I, I will. I, I think it's fun because it's a different approach, just like the har harmony as well as the orchestration and and the approach to the harmony makes certain things seem more genuine. You know, this um, you know this kind of jaunty uh, approach right in here works better with the new kind of harmony that you're that you're throwing in there. Um, so so that's all good, but just. You know, of course, it really changes the feel of things, doesn't it? It's it's more, um, it's less mysterious and um, and personal, and it's more um, kind of social. <laughs> it becomes more communal in its in its outreach. Um, you know, so anyhow, <clears throat> there really isn't a whole lot about this score that I could say, oh, well, you know, do this, don't do that kind of thing. I'm, I'm not so sure how necessary this is to, you know, I'm, and this seems a little fancy schmancy to me, um, you know, slurring, overlapping on the slurs and so on. I think it probably would, there's, you know, I mean, I don't know what discernible difference there possibly could be, except for to sort of maybe emphasize the motion, that sort of menuet kind of motion, you know, three, one, two, three, one, kind of kind of thing with the second voice, but then it's sort of obscured by the tying across of the second to third beat. So I would just say, like, you know, choose one, <clears throat> and, you know, I mean, you leave it in, but it's really not going to make a lot of difference in the long run. Uh, that Otherwise, you know, things are working great. We've got um, a sol ponticello, divisi, tremolo, and this little pizzicato on the third beat. This didn't quite work for me, like um, pizzicato on beat three and then pizzicato on beat one. I, I'm not so sure how that, you know, it's kind of, it sort of felt in the wrong place. Um, I mean, and you don't have to, to have regular patterns to things, but it, yeah, it just, <clears throat> almost felt like this should maybe go over here, right? Or or before the uh, before the bar. Anyhow, um, solo oboe. Now notice, like it's pretty obvious that this is a solo, right? So we don't even have to say solo. So this is the way Samuel has chosen this. It it's really you know it's probably a better way of doing it. Just mark a single instrument, and the player will play it as if it were a solo. Right? And then as the part unwinds here, this is nice. You don't take the oboe too high, but yeah, you know, clearing it up to F sharp, it's still pretty manageable on a mezzo forte diminuendo, right? Um, I would say here, you don't want to go mezzo forte diminuendo to mezzo piano. So I would say put a piano on the last note of all of these, uh, of this phrase, right? And, and you know, I, I see what you're trying to do here, sort of match the mezzo forte diminuendo and then having this come in at mezzo piano, right? But it really doesn't seem to be going anywhere. So so just try to like add a destination dynamic at the end here, and that will clarify things. Here it's not really necessary in the strings because you go to piano right there, right? But here you're going to pianissimo, right? So that will make the flutes die out sooner. So yeah, just just put a piano at the end of each of these bars just to make it all unified. The wind scoring in here is is pretty cool though. I, I really do like the, you know, just a really nice mixture of timbres in here. It, you know, it it's nicely done. It's, you know, it's it feels pretty professional to me. I think your beam groups here could be. Um, you know, six to a bar, like our covering six, beam covering six eighths in a bar. I think it's just clearer for the for the players to read. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of taking another look at things. Yeah, so antique symbols, that's fine, I think. Um, I think uh, just a regular glockenspiel is is also good there, and a little bit sparing on the timpani, just a little bit for punctuation, that all works great. Yeah, and I, I really did like the the um, muted horn and trumpet here. So yeah, so mute is going to have a different sound 
from stopping in terms of the horn, right? It's going to be um, not as snarly, uh, but it will still be sh more shallow and trebly. But here, like that works because of the kind of the the lift in the music and the lighter texture, right? So that with that mute goes really nicely, and there is enough um, there is enough supporting texture around it in the um, and the strings and the winds to where this can just be like a little light touch of um, of tone. Now you're not really giving them like you wouldn't want to say open after mute, right? You wouldn't want to say you would want to say open after stopped, right? So so just you hear mute and I would just say you know no mute, you know, right? Or just like right here is where you want to tell the player like you know mute off or you know no mute. Yeah, and I really do like the um, the sense of motion right in here. Uh, that's something that you know once again adds to like a a more um, exoteric kind of rather than esoteric, you know, like a, a reaching out kind of a feeling. And yeah, I mean, it would be great for like a a scene in a uh, in a film, uh, a, a nice spring day, and it really seems more like a crowd of people or a group of people right rather than an individual <laughs> right which is something like you know changing the harmony around changing the the feeling of the piece this radically that is what you are going to end up getting so you know if that was the intention nicely done but yeah clarinets and um and flutes working together that works great this is all nice and um I really like the sort of little <clears throat> the um, the addition of the winds right in there. That's all really nice. So yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I'm, I I don't really see a lot to pick apart right in here. Bum 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 bum. This is kind of nice though. Da da da. And as everything goes down, you go up. With the harmony and the flutes, but it still works because of the absorption of the um, of the overtones, right? So very very wise scoring right in there. And this is nice. The combination of the contra bassoon and bassoons with the tuba and the horns, right? Like and you sort of left out the heavy brass, other than the tuba right in here. So yeah, and then you just have that one single. Um, written a flat right in here that you know that carries over into this beautiful harmony the way that you've scored this just just really nice i mean very yeah there's a there's a you know there there's a nice polish to this right i don't want to say professional because in like and compare that and say oh well this has a professional polish that doesn't blah 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 but this has a nice polish to it right um, I never know who I might be talking to, like how far along down their career they are, you know. Um, and I don't, I don't want to condescend or to like build up or, or anything like that. But just you know, it's nice to see a score where a lot of uh, craft things are worked out really nicely. Okay. Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> so yeah. So, I mean, all pretty well scored. It's nice. I mean, it's and I, I really like the fact that it's so different from the ideas that I had and um, from even from the approach of the piece itself um, that it just brings in a new kind of flavor. And that bodes well for you, Samuel, because you never know when you might be asked to come in and clean up somebody else's work or to reinterpret your own work, right? Um, like, suppose you were the original composer of that piece of piano music and perhaps like one of the older school composers you had played out your ideas on a cassette recording on piano and sent it to the director say um the way that uh the original godfather ideas were played um uh, onto a cassette recorder for the director and the director got back to you and said, "Yeah, but you know, I just want it to be. It just seems that seems so like, um, you know, meditative. Can you make it like more bouncy and lighter and more outgoing, right? And that is what you did here. So, 
So that the ability to do that, I think, is really, really important. And uh, that's something that I value, you know, um, in my own work when when I'm able to change things around like that. Um, and it's and it's a necessary part of the project. So so mutability is a really important thing in music and in arranging. Right. Anyways, nicely done. I don't want to stay on it too far, but um, but yeah, um, yeah, it's worth another listen. Um, so so yeah so really great work and now on to the next entry Sorry about cutting you off there, Stephen. Uh, I know you had quite a few more bars in you uh, that you submitted with your arrangement, but I have to really cut everybody off brutally at bar 20 or I will never get through all 146 of these evaluations. Okay, so anyways, but, but really great start. Really fun, airy, light, beautiful music. Now, right here is an example of how you could use... Uh, the playback to proof your music a little bit more thoroughly, right? So did you notice how certain elements in the harmony, like especially this uh, second violin line, were really loud right in there? Well, that's because you didn't distribute this piano dynamic throughout the uh, entire piece. But, you know, what's interesting is you can just select all the bars and you can type command E and then just a single command P voila alright so no excuse alright everybody gotta learn that trick uh, and then in in other places some parts of the music were weak because uh, you know there there hadn't been like the the louder dynamic hadn't been introduced into it um, you know like right in here right so this should all be mezzo forte going forward Okay, um, but yeah, let, let's talk about one other thing here too, and that is one of my pet peeves. So this is a tip that I think I've released publicly and is also in 100 more orchestration tips, and that is this. Please, everybody, don't use the up roll mark, okay? Um, unless you have a down roll mark before it, right? Just use the regular roll mark. Right, so um, if we go to our little keypad here, and um, yeah, so that is way way better, right? So it's it's <clears throat> that is just the generic mark, right? So the up roll should only be used when there is a down roll to contrast it with, okay? Otherwise, when you add this up roll mark, you make the pianist or harpist think. Wait, wait, was there a down roll, down roll somewhere or a down, you know, a down uh, arpeggio mark somewhere else? So like they'll, they'll kind of look around for that and say, oh, geez, I guess not. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so it just is a waste of time. Just use this as the default. All right. So that's number one. Um, and <clears throat> this is a really, really long slur. All right. So I've talked about this a little bit before. Okay, there's some slurring across the downbeat here, and I've talked about that already on previous entries, so I'm not going to go over that too much. But, I mean, you could have, like, maybe, yum, like, as one big slur, and then another slur at the end. Or you could go, um, da, da, right, down, up, down up right okay so that's that's another thing just yeah try not to just dump piano slurs onto string parts okay and like this doesn't really mean anything like slur slur right like and and also at what part does this slur play you know what part does it play in the music right 
um, when the other parts don't have it. Right? Okay. All right. So getting past all of that, <clears throh> oh yeah, one more thing to proofread. Okay. So this is forte, and then everything else is softer underneath it. So it just really stands out in the in the playback. You know, eek, right? Just that is that really punchy thing. So it just really. You know, it's it's sort of like a slap in the face at the beginning of a really beautiful phrase, right? Now, I can see that being in there, even as just pizzicato, but maybe marked piano, right? And the same thing here with this oboe note, right? Like the oboe note was pianissimo, so maybe this should have been pianissimo too. All right. Anyway, I, yeah, so uh, other than that, I really, really like the pointillistic approach of this score. It's just really fun. Little bits and pieces of um, a jigsaw puzzle just scattered around, but putting them all together, they come together nicely. I thought was a really, really great idea. Um, yeah, there's so many, there are going to be so many amazing things that I will be evaluating. I actually spent the past four days laying out all of the videos that I am going to be evaluating all of the, excuse me, all of the scores in the videos that I'm going to be evaluating um, the video files so that I can just easily s just skate through them like I am today. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to put together maybe two, maybe three of these compilations of website evaluations today. We'll, we'll see how we go, how long my throat, uh, my voice lasts. <clears throat> but yeah, so far, just looking at all these scores and all these different outlooks and, and just ingenious little ideas. Uh, now here you probably don't need to go staccato and accent, right? I, I would say just like, like if you really want it to stand out, put an accent on it. Otherwise, just just pizzicato is fine, right? You don't need the, sta you don't need the staccato at all. Okay, but still really cool the way that this group goes together, right? And the way that you answer, right, your call and response here. But like, once again, um, you know, is, is this soft? Was this intended to be soft and then loud, right? Like a, because the dynamics don't really make sense with piano in the highest voice here, right? So, yeah, I, I mean, maybe you came, maybe you couldn't figure out how to finish this phrase or maybe you did want the top voice to be soft, but then it doesn't make sense against the wind. So, yeah, and then th these voices really stand out, right? So, yeah, so you need to, I think that just needed more proofing in the in the dynamics. Um, but, y you know, it, it does work. It, the thing you have to watch out about pointillistic um, kinds of scoring is that the fabric holds together and it doesn't just come apart. So you have, oops, you have organized groups playing off of each other and that's really, really valuable, right? So that some can support others with little bits of color and texture and little um, little points of, of uh, punctuation, while other groups can be a little bit more um, prominent, right? Yeah, so, okay, so like slurring across across the bar, right? So this is not going to work. And, and also like you are, I think you want this idea here, right? You wanted like two eighth notes and then like, this is just fancy. This is just, should just be written out as two eighth notes. And don't slur over two eighth notes, right? Because that means like you are, it's the same as this. It's like one... It's one note, uh, so so I mean you have to decide: do you want the player to bow across something, or do you want them to play two separate notes, right? So, like bowing, like a slur over uh, over two of the same note is always a quandary for a player. They have to sort of decide what you mean: do you want the bow to go the same direction twice, in which case you have to add like staccatos or or tenuto marks over them, right? So it it isn't just such an easy thing. But I would say the the main problem here is that there is no real strong downbeat in the strings because you have slurred across the downbeat, right? So I mean that sometimes that's completely acceptable, but other times it just really robs um I keep doing that. It really kind of robs the the downbeat of any kind of emphasis, right? Um yeah, especially when there isn't a strong note in the bass. 
at the same time, right? So just watch out for that. And then, or, you know, then slurring into a staccato, right? Now that's that's kind of nice. So, I mean, there are a few proofing things that, that need some work here. Like, you know, shouldn't all the winds have the same kind of slurring approach, right? Um, and then I already talked about the really long slur here. But I mean, but in generally, like except for like the proofing stage, um, it's a really, really cool idea. And I really liked it a lot. I thought that the color picture, the, you know, the sense of proportion was really, really nicely done. So just, you know, with some work on the dynamics, it could be good. And I thought that the bass clarinet, like using the bass clarinet throughout was really, really nice. Um, yeah, just absolutely no problems there. So, so yeah, so nice score. Just really, I mean, I thought all of these scores were really cool, and they all had this little touch of originality, like the voice of the arranger, the voice of the orchestrator. And in these uh, challenges, what's cool is that that is rarely missing, you know, or almost never missing. It like the even even with a a very inexperienced orchestrator, you still see like the beginnings of a personality kind of forming. Um, I feel that orchestrators just have just as strong personalities as composers, right? And usually an orchestrator is a composer. But sometimes an orchestrator does so much orchestration that they really are much more of an orchestrator than a composer. So I think that they are, um, you know, they're, they're two different jobs and they're almost like two different hats to wear really and it's great that you can do both when you're composing your own orchestral music and I feel that that is like the strongest um, you know when you're taking both of those roles at the same time but it doesn't mean that they are the same job necessarily and uh, different personalities like somebody can be like a really boring composer but like a great orchestrator so you know you never know what strength is going to be the strongest Anyways, really, really great group of uh, of scores to look at the first time. Got, boy, this has got me really excited. So I'm just going to go on to the next video and evaluate a bunch more before my house wakes up. By this time, it's uh, quarter to six. So let me see how much I can get done. And hopefully I'll have two or three of these compilation videos of the website evaluations ready today. So anyways, thank you so much, everybody. This was really, really fun, and I will see you in the next video.